All right, if I was to ask you this morning to turn to the most well-known verse in the Bible, I wonder what verse you would choose to turn to here this morning. Would it be in the book of Hezekiah? There is no book of Hezekiah. Uh, would it be in the book of Isaiah? Would it be in Psalms? Would it be in Matthew? Would it be in Acts? Would it be in Revelation? Uh, what book would it be in? Well, I think most of you know it's in the book of John, chapter number 3, and verse number 16. There you go. John three sixteen is our passage today. It's been a while since we have preached from this passage. It is a glorious, glorious passage. And the title of our message today is God Loves You. Aren't you thankful for the love of God this morning? Amen. God loves you. Uh, maybe nobody else does, but God does. And uh, we'll see that as we go through and want to preach from this passage of Scripture here this morning. I hope it will bless your heart. John 3, 16. You don't even really have to look at your Bible, probably. We can all just say it together. How about that? If you have to cheat, then cheat. But if you know it by heart, most, many people do. We're just going to say it together. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is John 3, 16. Now there are many passages in the Bible that have been chosen by some great person or other as a favorite text. All of you or most of you have heard of John Wesley, who spent a lot of time here in Savannah back in the 1700s. John Wesley's favorite verse a little bit different, but his favorite verse was Zechariah 3.2. And Zechariah 3.2 says, Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? That was his favorite verse. David Livingston, the great missionary that went to Africa, uh, he uh, preferred the last words of Matthew 28.20 where it says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That was David Livingston's favorite verse in the Bible. John Newton, some of you recognize that name, John Newton. He was a man that wrote Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. You can imagine his favorite verse would have something to do with grace, would you not? Well, it does. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That was John Newton's favorite verse. Martin Luther uh, of the Reformation, but he, uh, he, his favorite verse was Romans 1.17, The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Now, we could go on and on and on. We could ask you this morning uh, 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 your favorite verse or a verse that is so meaningful to you today, and we could get different verses. But uh, all of those verses were very meaningful to these men, but John 3.16, I believe, is everyone's verse. Everyone's favorite. If not their absolute favorite, uh, it's, it's their second favorite. And, and it's usually, this is the first verse that is usually memorized by somebody. Again, most people who have been Christians for any length of time have this verse memorized. And do you know it is also the first verse translated into a different language? If they are translating the Bible into a, a different language, and, and matter of fact, there's plenty of languages where they don't even hardly have a Bible verse in, a, in, in that language. But anyhow, the first verse they will translate will be John 3, 16, because it tells it all. It tells it all. And I will say this. If we only had this one verse in the Bible, if there was only this one verse in the Bible, do you realize the whole world could be saved from this verse? The whole world. God, it says, we say that is the greatest lover. God, the greatest lover, so loved the word so, that greatest degree, so loved the world, the greatest company, that he gave, which, ladies and gentlemen, is the greatest act. His only begotten son, the greatest gift. That whosoever, the greatest opportunity, believeth the greatest simplicity in him, the greatest attraction should not perish the greatest promise, but the greatest difference have the greatest certainty 
everlasting life, the greatest possession. And I'll remind you this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ is that greatest gift. A great theologian was asked at one time, what is the greatest thought that ever passed through his mind? And he paused for a while and he thought for a few moments on that that question, what is the greatest thought that ever went through his mind? And then he raised his head and he said with great grace and childlike simplicity, this is what he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And where did I learn that from? John 3, 16. That Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. This is a great truth that Christians down through the ages have acknowledged. And more than that, they have discovered the person of Jesus Christ in the Bible. And and the more that we discover of Him, the more we realize that He is that greatest gift and that Jesus loves me. You may be here this morning and you wonder, is the love of God for me? And I, I, I have an answer for that question, yes. The love of God is for you. And this morning, I want us to think about the love of God and that God loves you. And I want you to apply the love of God to your life. So first of all, this morning, I want us to see from John 3, 16 about God's love that we see a love that is unparalleled. A love that is absolutely unparalleled. Because it says, for God so loved. It is God who loved us and who loves us. Now, does anybody here need anybody to love you? Does anybody here need somebody to love? Oh, yes, we do. Every one of us here are glad that somebody in this world loves us. Uh, There may not be, uh, everybody may not love us. But I got news for you. We've got some that love us. And we can be thankful for that this morning. And matter of fact, when we find out sometimes that maybe somebody really does not love us, uh, that kind of shatters us, shatters us just a little bit. There are many times where people may think that God does not love me. And we think that sometimes, I believe, because we really know how unlovable we are. Now, you all look lovable this morning, but I bet you there was some time through the week you probably were not all that lovable. Now, if I'm wrong about that, you can correct me after church, all right? And uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, And then I may ask your husband or wife uh, uh, about that. But uh, we're, we're all, there's times where we're all unlovable, and I'll tell you, even in the times that we're unlovable, God still loves us. What an amazing love. It's unparalleled. You know, it shouldn't be this way, but most of the time our love is conditional. You know what that means? Well, as long as you treat me good, you know, I'll treat you good. As long as you love me the way I think I ought to be loved, then I'm going to love you uh, the way that I think you ought to be loved. There's been times in my life, I'm sure in your life as well, where, you know, you kind of get on the wrong side of of a relationship or a situation with a person and, And then, this is what they'll say. Well, I want you to think about all that I've done for you. Well, let me tell you something. That means that's conditional love. God's love is not like that. And I'm so thankful. His love is unconditional. He loves us. And it's so unparalleled. He loves us when we are unlovely or unlovable. This is really not... Uh, It shouldn't be that kind of love that we should have, that conditional love, but we have it, but God does not have it. And I want you to think about it next time that your husband doesn't treat you the way that you think you ought to be treated, or your wife doesn't think you the way you ought to be treated, or your mom or dad don't, don't treat you the way you think you ought to be treated. Listen, continue on loving, because that's the way God loves, and the way God wants you to love. When, when this old world brings you down, and listen, if you, you hang around long enough, this old world's going to just trample on you and going to beat you up and, and, and going to make you think that you're nothing, you always remember, always remember that God loves you no matter what. It's unparalleled. And, and because it's unparalleled, it is beyond our ability to totally understand it. We really cannot totally understand even God's love for us. His love is beyond our ability to understand we, because we look at it and we say there's no rationalization for it. 
we cry out like David, my sin is ever before me. And, and we look around and we say, I don't see any reason why God should love me, but yet He does love you. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, But God who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. And then the next verse goes on to say, By grace are ye saved. We may wonder sometimes, why does God love me? But He does. His love is unparalleled. It's, it's beyond our ability to understand. It's beyond our ability to exhaust. Think about that. You can never exhaust the love of God for you. It is infinite. It continues on and on and on. Uh, 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 we talked about the loving kindness extended to us in, in Sunday school this morning, extended to us all of our lives and all for all of eternity. We can be thankful for that. I thank God that He didn't love me for just a little while. But it lasts forever. It was God's love that reached down into sin's dark pit for me. It was God's love that uh, washed me clean in the blood of the Lamb. It was God's love that put the robe of righteousness on my shoulders and called me son. We heard in the 930 service again from, from John the Third about the prodigal son and how the father came back. Uh, when the son came back, the father ran and, and, and met him. And you'll remember that's the only time in the Bible where it says that God ran. The only time in the Bible that it says God ran. And he ran so that he could show his love for his son. And he runs to show us uh, his love for us. And let me tell you something. You cannot exhaust it. You can't. It, it can never be go away you can never exhaust it i heard a preacher one time that uh he he told this story about coming to town and preaching about a mighty powerful god that we have a mighty powerful god and he made this statement now just bear with me okay don't don't jump ahead of me here and, and just hang in there he made this statement in his message he said this mighty powerful glorious god is so mighty that he can forgive you for 1543 sins and many people heard his word and gladly listened and they trusted this great and powerful god who was able to save from 1543 sins a few years later one of the men came to the great evangelist and said, Sir, I am so glad that God can forgive 1,543 sins. My problem is that yesterday I committed sin number 1,542. And it appears I only have one to go. What will happen when I commit sin 1,544? The evangelist replied, I'm afraid, my friend, as the English say, you had your chips. You see, God only has the power to forgive 1,543 sins. If you pass that limit, you are without hope. Now, we would look at a message like that and we'd say, what? What in the world are you talking about? Now, that was an illustration, okay? That's not the gospel. This morning, some of you are looking at me. Is that true? 1,543 cents, that's it. That was an illustration uh, to get people's attention to think this way. Because what a sad message that would be. What a sad message that would be. But what a glorious truth that that is not the case. God is able to forgive all of our sins. Not just 1,543. All of them. He is able. Matter of fact, Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore, he is able also to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. There is no limit to his love. There is no limit to his salvation. It is unparalleled. For God so loved. It, it is beyond our ability to understand. It is beyond our ability to exhaust. It is unparalleled. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19 says uh, 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 that uh, Paul wanted them that they may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of Christ. 
Paul told those uh, uh, Ephesians, he said, listen, the, the love of God, you can't even box it in. You, you can't, if, if you had, uh, you know, if we wanted to measure something today, I could measure this communion table and I could tell you how long it is and how wide it is and how deep it is and all of this and that and the other. But listen, you can't do that to the love of God. You can't do that. It's, it's outside the box. It's boundless. It's unfathomable. And, and we know it, but I've got news for you. We only know it in part. The song that we sing sometimes, the love of God, the hymn is in our, in our hymn book. And it says, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair, talking of Adam and Eve, bowed down with care. God sent his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. The second verse says, could we with ink the ocean fill, or imagine filling the ocean with ink. And were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade. We go out here and we have the ocean is full of ink, the sky is parchment, uh, uh, we, every stalk on earth were a quill where we could write with, and every man on, on planet earth was a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. <laughs> Imagine that. We go out here to Tybee, or, or you, you travel and you, you see the ocean. And, and uh, we were in Pensacola the other day. You know, you go out there and you see the Gulf of Mexico out there. And, I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. That's all you see is water imagine that the love of god and the chorus says the love of god how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song so we see first a love unparalleled for god so loved secondly this love moved god to action this love that God has for us moved him to action because we see that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I'll, I'll remind you this morning, that is a statement of fact. God sent his son to die for me and for you. God don't have to, does not have to justify his actions. He doesn't have to rationalize it to us. But he, we know that he did it. He sent his son. It is a statement of fact. And he sent his son because he loved us. A little girl and her mom. We're reading the New Testament one morning when they came to John 3.16. And stopping for a moment in the reading, the mother asked, Don't you think it is wonderful? The child, looking surprised, answered in the negative, said no. And of course the mother was somewhat astonished, repeated the question to which the little girl replied, Why no, Mommy? It, it would be wonderful if it were anybody else. But it's just like God. Because God loved us, he sent his son. That's just like God, to give. Because you can, you can give without loving. Listen to me. You can give somebody something and not love them. Did you know that? But you can never love without giving. And because God loves, it's just like God. He gave. And he gave his son. It is God's nature to give freely of his grace and of his mercy. God gave his son again because he loved us. And, and listen, what motivates you this morning? Is it, is it, is it the things of the world? Is it, is it money? Is it success? Is it uh, uh, knowledge? What, what motivates you this morning? Is it popularity? Let me tell you something. What should motivate us this should be the love of God. The love of God that God loves me and I want to be all I can be for him. Because of what Jesus has done for me. Listen, it's a statement of fact. It's an example of love. Uh, God says he gave his only begotten son uh, for us to die. And I'm telling you, that is the greatest gift and the greatest example of love this world has ever seen. How many of you like love stories? Everybody likes love stories. Everybody likes movies, you know, with happy endings. 
where the guy gets the girl, the girl gets the guy, you know, and they go off into ever, uh, 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 ever, ever land, and everybody's happy, and everything's good. Everybody likes wonderful love stories. There's, there's a matter of fact, there's a, the Bible is full of a lot of great love stories, one of them being Ruth and, and Boaz, but there's, there's a lot of great love stories, but we, we like that. I want you to think about the love story of God for us. What great love. Matter of fact, the Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. God was moved to action because of his love. We should be moved to action because of love. Because of God's love for us and our love for God. And it, and it moved him to action. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'll say to you this morning, thirdly, it is a love that is unrestricted, absolutely unrestricted, because then it says that whosoever, that whosoever, I want to remind you this morning that there are no names there. Aren't you glad there are no names that are given here in John three sixteen? It doesn't say, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so could believe on him and have everlasting life. It doesn't say that. It does not say that at all. There are no names given here. And you know what? There's no way to misunderstand, misunderstand whosoever. There's no way to misunderstand it. It doesn't say all Americans. It, it doesn't say all bald-headed people. It doesn't say all skinny people. It doesn't say those things. It says that whosoever. There's no way for us to misunderstand it. D.L. Moody once said this, The great trouble is that people take everything in general and do not take it to themselves. Think about this. Suppose a man should say to me, Moody, there's a man in Europe who left $5 million to a certain individual. D.L. Moody said, Well, I don't doubt it. That's a rather common thing. I don't think any more about it. But suppose the man comes up to me and says, there's a man who left $5 million to you. Then I pay attention. You will say, to me? He left it to me? Yes, he left it to you. And of course, if I find out he left it to somebody else, I said, well, that's good. How about it? But then he says, he's left it to me. I said, tell me all about it. Tell me every detail. I want to know, when can I get it? It's all mine. He goes on to say this with this illustration. He says, so we are apt to think that Christ died for sinners. That he died for everybody and for nobody in particular. But when the truth comes to me that eternal life is mine and all the glories of heaven are mine, I begin to be interested. I begin to pay attention. Now let me tell you something. Put your name there. See, make it particular. Make it personal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that John Trammell Jr. would believe on him. He would never perish but have everlasting life. Put your name there. Make it personal. That whosoever includes you this morning. And see, his love demands just a simple task. Because it says, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. Listen, it matters not how others feel. God loves you with an abiding love and only you have to believe it. So have you believed it? Have you trusted God with your soul? Have you believed that love this morning? Have you accepted that love this morning? A minor a coal miner once said to a preacher, he said, I'd like to be a Christian, but I cannot receive what you said tonight. And the preacher said, why not? Why can't you receive that? Well, I'd give anything to believe that God would forgive my sins, but I can't believe he'll forgive me if I just turn to him. It sounds too cheap. The preacher looked at him and said, have you been working today? The miner replied, yes, I was down in the pit as usual. Why? He said, the preacher said, well, how did you get out of the pit? He said, the miner said, the way I usually do. I got into the cage and was pulled to the top. 
The preacher said, well, how much did you pay to come out of the pit? The miner looked at the preacher in astonishment. Pay? Pay? Of course, I didn't pay anything. The preacher said, well, weren't you afraid to trust yourself to that cage? Wasn't it too cheap? The coal miner said, oh, no, it, it was cheap for me. But it cost the company a whole lot of money to sink that shaft. And then the implication of what he had said struck him and he saw that though he could have salvation without money and without price, it had cost the infinite God a great price to rescue a lost man. And it's a love that's absolutely unrestricted. Anybody, anybody, whosoever can believe and be saved. And then lastly this morning, it is a love with lasting results. A love with lasting results. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is a love that has lasting results. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans tells us. And listen, should not perish is the greatest promise. But is the greatest difference. Have is the greatest certainty. And everlasting life is the greatest possession. I'll tell you right now, if you're truly saved this morning, everything else can be taken from you except your salvation. Everything else can be taken from you except your salvation. Your family could be taken from you. Your possessions could be taken from you. The clothes you've got on your back could be taken from you. We know there's been instances in history where people were taken as prisoners and prisoners of war and stripped down naked. And had nothing left. No possessions, no money, uh, no house to live in, nothing. You can have everything taken away from you. You can have your health taken away from you. But you can never have that everlasting life taken away from you. Everlasting, I got a news flash for you. News flash! News flash! Everlasting means everlasting. I, I, I'd love to preach salvation by works. By that, you know, you, you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to do the other in order to go to heaven. But that's not the way it is in the Bible. It's salvation by grace through faith. That not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Like the physical birth, the spiritual birth happens personally. I know here's another news flash for you. I was there when I was born. You were there when you were born. I ask little kids sometimes, I'll say, was your mama there when you were born? And boy, they just look at you funny. And they, they figure that out after a while. I was there when I was born. It, was, it happened to me personally. I was also there when I was born again. Amen. It happened personally. And I'm telling you, it is, it is uh, the the. Spiritual birth is experienced definitely. I'm going to tell you, I really believe that you really know when you got born again. You may not know the date, but you know that you got born again. And it endures permanently. It's everlasting. Everlasting means everlasting. It's offered lovingly because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has given me now a, a, a past that is gone and a future that is before us. And he's given me fellowship with, with him in the family of God. But I'll tell you this much. This everlasting life must be received willingly. Nobody can receive it for you. You must receive it yourself personally and willingly. So if you don't know Christ today, today's the day to come and receive his love for you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.